Okay, hello. Um, you ask one last time if there's questions about the final paper assignment or about grading. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I decided to just go on and talk about the reading for this time rather than trying to say anything more about the reading from last time. Um, so, uh, um, this part of the dialogue starts when Demia introduces what he calls the a priori proof. Right, as opposed to Cleanthes' um, proof of the existence and nature of God, um, which is a posteriori, that is, it's based on experience. Well, when will you hear back about the outline? Um, well, I know that, I. I know Anna at least is planning to um, hold a, a Zoom session that you can go to to get feedback from her and your peers. I don't know if Austin, I haven't got an email about that from Austin, but I think Austin is also doing that. But anyway, um, that's probably the, the best way to get feedback about it. Um, is the metaphysics exercise going to be curved? Yes, the metaphysics exercise is definitely going to be curved. Yes. That was a direct message. Someone asked me that. Um, yes, Austin has office hours. Uh, but I know that, um, so yeah, you could definitely go to that if you want. Um, well, maybe that's the same thing. All right. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. So it's uh, you should you should ask your your TA. I think um, um, or ask either TA or both TAs. And as far as the metaphysics exercises, yeah. As I said again, I mean, I have to uh, now that all the scores are basically in, uh, I should uh, sit down and figure out what the grading scale for those metaphysics exercises is going to be. But I just, you know, want to repeat, like there were some, like number six, I know a lot of people got zero on. So, uh, you know, it was too hard, obviously. I tried to figure out why it was too hard by looking at the questions, and I sort of understand. Um, but in any case, you know, so like if you got zero on number six, uh, a lot of people did, which means since it's going to be curved or in other words, since the grades are going to be based on the distribution, uh, not on some pre-assigned scale, if, if you're getting zero on something that a lot of people are getting zero on, it's nothing to worry about. Um, and there were uh, several others where, where a huge number of people got one and some people got zero. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I have managed to make them easier than they were in previous years, but they're still too hard, I guess. Um, um, Well, anyway, be that as it may, um, I guess, and I'll just say one other thing about that, which is that in the past, the you know, and this will happen again this year, the first of all, the grade distribution on the metaphysics exercises portion of the grade is going to be similar to the grade distribution on the papers, and number two, 
for individuals, they're not usually way out of whack with each other. So, like, without knowing exactly what the grading scale is going to be, it's like, I'm just saying it's unlikely that you're getting like a B plus on the written assignments and you're failing the metaphysics exercises. It's possible, of course, especially like if you didn't do them or something, but it's unlikely. All right. Um, well, I mean, literally failing. Again, in the past, it's only people who got a total score of zero on all of them have failed, got a fail for that portion of the grade. And not very many people got C's, you know. Uh, all right. Um, uh, okay, sorry. Back to Hume, unless there are more questions about that. So, right, so so Cleanthes proof is a posteriori. It's based on experience, right? That is, it's based on what our experience of the world, what it's actually like. Um, uh, this a priori proof, I mean, there's actually two versions of it. I'm not sure that Demia realizes, not 100% sure Hume realizes. I feel like he must. But anyway... There's really uh, two versions of this. I'm not sure if Demia realizes they're both kind of versions of the same proof. Um, they're kind of versions of what Kant in classifying all the possible types of proof for the existence of God calls the cosmological proof. So this means that it's not strictly a priori in the sense that Kant means that. Um, because although it's not based on anything in particular about our experience of the world, it um, depends on the fact that there is a world, which in some sense we only know from experience. That is, we don't know how to prove from first principles that a world exists. We only know a world exists because we experience it. Um, but still, I guess, uh, without trying to figure out exactly what Demia means by a priori, this is, you know, like much more a priori, so to speak, than clean at these proofs. Um, and, um, I guess the other thing to say about this, besides that this is a version of what Kant calls the cosmological proof, is that it's therefore related to the Descartes' proofs of the existence of God in the third meditation. The third meditation also starts with realizing that something exists. In the meditations, of course, it's just me, the meditator, right? I realize that I exist. And starting with that, I need to prove that God exists. Um, um, as opposed to the proof in the fifth meditation, the so-called ontological proof, which is um, is strictly a priori in Kant's sense. It's supposed to prove that God exists without um, knowing anything else about what exists. Um, okay, so anyway, Hume... Uh, I. I take it, I mean, Locke mentions that proof. Of course, Hume knows about it because it's in Descartes, but I take it Hume thinks that that's so absurd that he's not even going to have Demia propose it. <laughs> um, so, but he does have Demia propose this one. So the way uh, a cosmological proof works in general is that you start with the existence of the world. That's why it's called a cosmological proof. Right. So we start with um, so what is a world? Well, um, roughly speaking, a world is anything that's not God. This is supposed to be to you. The world is basically anything that's not God. Um, um, it's clearly not God, 
and um, it's clearly not God because it has some kind of imperfection which rules out that it's caused itself to exist. Right? So a world is something imperfect. And therefore not self-caused. Now, I mean, there's different versions of this depending on what the imperfection is. Like the one that Kant, the version that Kant considers, um, and that's one of the versions we have here, take, starts from the fact that the world is contingent. Um, supposedly we know that. Hume and Kant both end up saying we don't really know that. And moreover, that in some sense we don't know what it means exactly. Well, actually, should I say that about Hume? No, I guess Hume ends up saying that, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to what Hume says in a second. All right. So anyway, the world is contingent, meaning that it's not necessary, that it didn't, we can't, we can't prove that it must exist. Um, uh, well, but of course, it's supposed to be stronger than that. Not only can't we prove that it must exist, it could not exist. It might not have existed. It does, but that's, there's nothing necessary about that. So it's contingent. And then you say, well, uh, every contingent thing has to be explained by, caused by something else to be the way it is rather than the other way that it could have been. That's called the principle of sufficient reason. So um, if you accept that and you accept that the world is contingent, then it seems to follow from the existence of something contingent that something else must exist that explains it. Of course, if that other thing that exists is also contingent, you haven't got anywhere. So uh, assuming that an infinite regress is no good here, um, you have to eventually get back to something that necessarily exists. And the thing that necessarily exists um, well, at least it doesn't have this imperfection, so it's not clearly not God in that sense, but then you try to prove that it must be infinitely perfect. Um, um, but there's other types of imperfections that you can use here. When Locke gives his version of this proof, I don't remember how much I was able to get into that when we got to that point in Locke, but when Locke gives his version of this proof, he doesn't uh, talk about the world being contingent. He just talks about the fact that the world had a beginning in time. Um, the supposed fact that wor the world had a beginning in time. If the world had a beginning in time, again, it didn't cause itself to exist. Because something had to already exist that explained it. Um, why, it why the world started to exist then. Um, and then, again, you try to prove that that thing... So, I mean, again, by ruling out an infinite regress, you say there must be something that has always existed. So, instead of proving a necessary existence, you prove a eternal existence, at least in past time. And then, based on that, uh, again, you try to, to prove what other attributes it must have. Um, However, uh, another way of going, so it's, you know, so the imperfection could be contingency or it could be beginning in time. Right, you understand? That's, a, that's an, imperf it's an, it's an imperfection not to have always existed because there could have been like more of it and there wasn't, so it's imperfect, <laughs> to put it in the simplest possible way. But another way of starting is with doubt or desire. 
Um, this is what Descartes uses in the third meditation. Um, it's also a kind of imperfection. Um, and it's really a kind of desire. It means that you desire to know something, but you don't know it. Um, so, in effect, Demia tries two versions of this proof, and the first one is this, and the second one is something like this. This one is in section nine, and this is what Demia calls the a priori proof. But um, this one is what they get into in section 10. So the usual objection or problem that you get into when you prove the existence of God using the cosmological proof um, is the problem of evil. This, leads, this proof leads straight to the problem of evil. What is the problem of evil? Well, um, you know, the proof con is, tries to conclude from an imperfect effect to a perfect cause. And the objection is, wait, how could a perfect cause cause an imperfect effect? Right, so in the, that is in the most abstract possible sense of the problem of evil. The problem of evil is just, again, that the world is something imperfect. And even though in the cosmological proof we were trying to use that to prove that it has a cause that is perfect, you can turn around and try to use that to prove that its cause, if it has any, must be imperfect because it's an imperfect effect. Um, now, uh, um, in the meditations, in Descartes' meditations, uh, that, um, uh, a version of the problem of evil, which for, in that situation is just the problem of error, right? Like, why is it that I'm sometimes wrong? <laughs> Um, uh, is, uh, comes up in the fourth meditation, right after the third meditation proof. In the dialogues, um, uh, I guess, similarly, the problem comes up after this proof. That is, um, Philo and Cleanthes don't raise that problem in response to uh, the first, like, metaphysical version of the proof. Um, now, um, why is it that they raise it only with respect to the second version and not the first version. Um, I mean, one reason would be to say that the response to the objection in this, in this case is too easy. Um, so, um, because if you unpack what the objection is in this case, what you're asking is, how can a necessary cause have a contingent effect? But um, an effect can't in itself be necessarily existent. If it were, it wouldn't be an effect. Right? I mean, an effect means that it wouldn't be there if it weren't for its cause, roughly speaking. At least that's one way of, of phrasing it. So it wouldn't be there if it weren't for its cause. 
So it must be contingent. That is, it must be have been possible for it not to exist if it weren't for this cause. Um, um, you know, there um, there may be problems with that answer. I think, um, in in a sense, you can understand Spinoza as one way to understand what happens in Spinoza is that he thinks doesn't think that answer is any good, and therefore he thinks that this proves that the only effect a necessary cause can have is itself. Um, so, therefore, it proves that there is no world. There's only God, right? There's only a necessary existence, which is Spinoza's view, at least uh, one way of, of putting it. Um, but anyway, uh, so that may be one reason they don't bring up that objection here, that it would be too easy for Demia to respond to, apparently. Um, but um, I think, actually, that's really kind of backwards. I think from Hume's, that is, from Hume's point of view, that's kind of backwards. I think, uh, you know, um, according to Hume, the fact that the answer is so easy is a sign that the proof doesn't make any sense. Um, and uh, it doesn't make or that doesn't have any force, and it doesn't have any force because contingency is not actually an observed property of the world, right? Like, we don't observe that the world could not, might have not existed. <laughs> we only observe that it does exist. Um, that was what made me say that Hume ag agrees with Kant about this, that we don't know that the world is contingent. But I, I and actually, on reflection, I don't think that's right. He thinks we do know, but we don't know by observing that it has a property of contingency. So, um, so since we couldn't actually have learned that about the world, we're really basically just assuming that about the world. Um, and um, um, in other words, there's no way of reconstruing this proof as empirical. It, that is, it really is pure. It, it really, when you look at it, and here is, I think, is another point where Hume sort of agrees with Kant about this. When you look into it more carefully, you realize that it actually isn't based on our experience that the world exists. The experience that the world exists would have to mean we experience that something contingent exists. But contingency is not something that you experience about something. So instead what's going on here is we really are trying to prove it from nowhere. Not really assuming, there's not really having experience that something exists, but just that is that something contingent exists, but just assuming it. And therefore, Hume, or at least his characters Philo and Cleanthes, are going to reject this version of the proof as absurd. Um, whereas on this version of the proof, um, they're able to reconstrue it as an empirical proof. And when it's reconstrued that way, the problem of evil, in this case, changes from a kind of metaphysical puzzle, which the way I've been putting it all along, it's, right, it's a metaphysical puzzle. How can an imperfect effect have a perfect cause? But when you turn it into... Um, when you turn this into a serious observation of the world and attempt to conclude something from it, the problem of evil changes from a metaphysical puzzle into what looks like a huge piece of evidence against a certain empirical hypothesis. 
And that's the way Philo ends up pressing it, not only against Demia, but also against Cleanthes. Okay, are there questions about that so far? The phrase problem of evil doesn't occur here in the dialogues. I'm actually not even sure how old the phrase problem of evil is. It's something you think I would know, but I don't know where it comes from. Hmm. Anyway, uh, um, so like, uh, but this, it's a convenient label that people use now for roughly speaking what's going on here. Okay, so um, so I'm just, I hope, just going to say a few things about this one and then try to get out to say more about this one and then what happens after, because what happens after this and the objection to this is that Demia um, gets upset and leaves and then Philo and Cleanthes, with Pamphilus still there, have their own private conversation. I mean, it's not really private because Pamphilus is there, but... Um, so, um, right, so this is Demia's version of it. It's on page 54, near the beginning of part nine. Whatever exists must have a cause or reason of its existence. Note, it's not entirely clear that cause and reason are the same thing. That's another way of attacking this proof. Um, and, but anyway, actually, I guess it is one of the ways that Philo and Cleanthes attack it. Um, whatever exists must have a cause or reason of its, its existence, it being absolutely impossible for anything to produce itself or be the cause of its own existence. In mounting up, therefore, from effects to causes, we must either go on tracing an infinite succession without any ultimate cause at all, or must at last have recourse to some ultimate cause that is necessarily existent. Um, so you notice that Demia did not state this very precisely. Because the way it's stated, there's a contradiction in it. I think uh, Hume deliberately had Demia do that because he, he thinks there is a contradiction and that Demia is uh, unwittingly, unwittingly expressing it in the way he, he puts the proof. But there's a contradiction because it starts off by saying whatever exists must have a cause or reason of its existence that would mean that there's no such thing as something that necessarily exists and doesn't need a cause. Um, but, uh, um, but, uh, presumably what Demia means to say is any contingent existence must have a cause or reason of its existence. Right, so then the proof goes through. Every contingent, or it looks like it goes through, every contingent existence must have a cause or reason of existence, and therefore in tracing them back, and implicitly there can't, well actually explicitly, Demia goes on to say this explicitly, there can't be an infinite series here, therefore uh, when we go back in the series we must at some point get to a necessary existence, and that is God. Um, so Philo and Cleanthes both attack this. Um, um, and there's several different responses, actually. But the main one, I guess, at least the one I'm going to talk about, is the claim that contingency and necessity um, aren't and can't be specific qualities which we conceive of as belonging to some existent or derived from any specific qualities like that. Um, 
right? So it's not only that we don't observe or experience the world to be contingent, but uh, when we say the world is exist because contingent, we're not actually attributing some property to it. Like we are when we say, for example, the world contains doubt or desire. Um, well, what else could it be then if we're not attributing some property to it? And so uh, basically the answer is that, at least the first answer is that contingency belongs to the very nature of believing that something exists believing in a matter of fact. Whereas necessity belongs to believing something about relation of ideas. Right? So it's not a property of the object. It's a property of the type of belief that's in question. Um... This is what Cleanthes says on the next page, page 55. Um, oops. At least I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing it um, or explaining why he says this. Whatever we conceive as existent, we can also conceive as non-existent. There is no being, therefore, whose non-existence implies a contradiction. Um, why am I saying that, that, that what that means is the same as basically contingency belongs by definition to belief about matters of fact? Well, I mean... Uh, it's really just a restatement of the argument we already saw in the first inquiry about the nature of belief. Remember, the argument in the first inquiry was that um, belief can't be uh, an idea that we add on to the idea of something. So, here, you know, here's the idea of um, a snowball. To believe that a snowball exists can't mean adding another idea into this one, the idea of existence. Right? And the argument in the first inquiry to, that was supposed to establish that was that if that were true, since I can add whatever idea I want to this complex idea to form a new complex idea, I could just add the idea of existence to any idea, and then I would believe that the thing that that's the idea of exists. So I could believe whatever I wanted to. Um, um, which, obviously, I can't. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's different ways of understanding why that's so obvious. But in any case, if um, you kind of turn that the other way around, um, you can say that uh, I can't ever, by looking at what ideas are included in my complex idea, cause myself to believe that the thing exists or determine that the thing exists because none of these ideas will be existence. Um, if one of these ideas could be existence, then and now it's kind of the opposite. Since I can take any idea that I want out, <laughs> I could also form the idea of this thing as not existing. So none of these ideas that's included in the complex idea of the thing is existence. So it can't be a contradiction to say it doesn't exist. So believing that something exists, that is, believing a matter of fact, is 
um, by definition, believing something contingent. That is something the opposite of which doesn't apply a contradiction, assume and as Philo and Cleanthes understand it. Um, right, and that shows that the idea of a necessary existent is uh, absurd. So, I mean, it doesn't exactly show where the problem is in the proof. They have other attacks that are supposed to show where the problem is in the proof. Um, but, I mean, I, well, I guess I should say, no, actually, the way I've been developing it kind of does say where the problem is in the proof. It, it, it means that a contingent thing is not a kind of thing that's less perfect than a necessary thing. Again, if it were, that would mean that um, a contingent thing is something you can either add the idea of existence to or not. And a necessary thing is a thing that where you have to put in the idea of existence, but neither of those make sense. Um, so rather, when we say something exists contingently, all we mean is that it exists, basically, right? To believe something exists is to believe that it exists contingently. So the whole proof does not make any sense. All right, that's everything I wanted to say about this first version, which you could call the metaphysical version of the proof. Are there questions about that before I go on? Okay, so the second version, you might call it a moral version. Um, it's not, so there's something Kant calls the moral proof of the existence of God, which uh, is Kant's own proof of the existence of God. It's a proof from a practical rather than a theoretical standpoint. It, Kant argues that all proofs of the existence of God from a theoretical standpoint must fail. And that's actually why he classifies them. He says, these are all the possible kinds of proof and they all fail. <laughs> um, so uh, now, I mean, this, this one that we're talking about here is not the same as Kant's moral proof by any means, but it is kind of connected as I will try to point out if I have time. So, um, if I were to put this version of the proof in the form of an argument, like so that it sounded like a version of the cosmological proof, it might go something like this. Like, um, I find that I desire something that I lack. That is, I'm uneasy. And therefore, I could not have caused myself to exist. Um, so, you know, why does that mean I couldn't have caused myself to exist? Um, the way Descartes puts it is that if I had so much power as to cause myself to exist from nothing, I would also have enough power to give myself every per perfection which I can conceive. Um, that at first blush does not sound like such a great argument, maybe, but I think actually it is a pretty good argument. Uh, I don't want to go into it too much, but it's, um, um, I mean, if you think about what causing yourself to exist would be like, um, it, you couldn't fall something that caused itself to exist couldn't fall short of its concept of itself. Something like that is the proof. In any case, uh, it's not, again, not necessary to get into the details because it, it's not, unlike in the meditations, that's this proof, is, it's not made explicitly in those terms. You know, Demia just says uh, such a, um, a miserable, being as we are must be dependent on something else, meaning it couldn't have caused itself to exist, um, but doesn't really explain why. Um, 
and Philo and Cleanthes don't question that. So let's say that part is good, so I couldn't have caused myself to exist. That is, I'm a world, so to speak. I'm not God. Um, and, yeah, I guess, I mean, here, actually, I wrote something better in my notes. If I, yeah, here's a way to see it maybe better. If I cause myself to exist, my concept of myself would be the concept of what I will myself to be. Right? I would have, so to speak, but of course it couldn't work this way. I would have, so to speak, before I existed, thought to myself, okay, what do I want to cause exist to exist? And that's what I cause to exist. That would be the act of willing something, yourself to exist, and then existing because of that. So, of course, it can't take, take, take place in two stages like that, because you can't do something before you exist. It, but... Um, uh, but if the concept of causing yourself to exist meant anything, it would it would have to be a kind of that would have to be a kind of metaphor for it at least. Um, so again, your concept of yourself would be exactly the concept of what you you want to be. So you couldn't lack perfections um, and yet want them. So, right, so, in, so, so therefore, since I do desire things that I lack, I must not be God, I must be a world, um, and therefore there must be something else that caused me to exist, and then, etc. the proof goes through the same way. Um, and that's exactly how it works out in the third meditation. At least it's it's clearest. There's kind of two proofs in the third meditation. It's clearest in the in the second or two versions of the third meditation proof. What I'm saying now is clearest in the second version. Um, but you know, so in Descartes' version of it in the third meditation, the thing that I desire and lack is to know everything, to be certain about everything. Um, so the, the uneasiness I feel, the desire for something I lack is just doubt, being uncertain about something, anything. Um, And actually, I mean, uh, this is the way the cosmological proof will tend to appear um, in usually in, well, it's the way the cosmological proof and therefore the problem of evil will tend to appear in philosophical, metaphysical, philosophical treatments of it. Um, I mean, I, well, I guess I could say, so, so why is it that, that 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 tiny imperfection is what Descartes focuses on? I mean, for one thing, you could say, well, it's the only imperfection the meditator could possibly know about at this point in the meditations. Nothing else has been proved to exist. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, but... Uh, but beyond that, I think that in like abstract philosophical treatments of this, um, philosophers generally will choose the, the smallest possible imperfection um, in order to make it really clear how the proof is supposed to work. Um, rather than confusing things by bringing in like really big, disturbing problems. That's the way it usually goes, but that's not the way it goes um, when Demia and Philo, egging Demia on, bring up this, start this topic, as they would say, in part 10. Um, instead, they end up pulling out all the stops to show that the world is not just a little bit imperfect. It's really, really bad. <laughs> um, uh, 
Now, um, so this is more, this is less like the usual philosophical problem of evil, and it's more like the problem of evil in the book of Job or something, where it's, um, where again, rather than being a puzzle about perfection and imperfection, it's a complaint, an accusation against God, actually. Right? It's like, if you're so good, how come all these innocent people die and there's disease and et cetera, et cetera? Um, so, um, so why does it come up in this version here? Um, so I think, I mean, there's kind of two answers to it, what, to that. Um, the, the easy answer is that Philo is going to need that really strong version to turn this, um, argument against Cleanthes, um, because Cleanthes is, doesn't claim to prove that God is, uh, infinitely perfect. Um... But that doesn't really explain why Demia is doing this. Um, and, you know, I mean, so Philo and Cleanthes both suggest that Demia is doing this because it's traditional to do it, and it's traditional to do it for various nefarious reasons. Um, but it's not clear that that Demia thinks those reasons are nefarious. And I guess, I mean, you might put it this way, that like what Demia really thinks everyone with common sense agrees on um, is that God is the proper object of worship or religion. And at least as an empiricist understands what that means, what that means is God is an object of hope and fear. That's what everyone agrees on. Um, I think that's one reason why Cleanthes' first response to this is to say, this is on page 62, um, I can observe something like what you mentioned in some others, replied Cleanthes, but I confess I feel little or nothing of it in myself, and I hope that it is not so common as you represent it. So, in other words, so I guess maybe I didn't make the full connection here, right? So the reason Demia is emphasizing the, like, the truly... Um, painful and wicked the painful nature of our existence that is like natural evil and the wicked nature of human beings that is moral evil the reason demia is emphasizing them so much is because um what demia really wants to emphasize is that you should hope for something and or fear something from the cause of the world. Um, so, uh, um, so for that we want to, first of all, it's really not an argument that's going to make you do that. Really, Demia wants to introduce a certain mood. Um, and um, and the mood is one is a mood of dependence and susceptibility to hope and fear, and to induce that mood, the right thing to do to to say the world isn't absolutely perfect because it could have been slightly bigger than it is, or we I could have known everything instead of a lot of things, or something like that is not sufficient. Um, that's why Demia is pressing this uh, really dark view of what the world is like. 
Um, and, and that's why, and Cleanthes' response to that, if I'm understanding this correctly, Cleanthes' response to that is, well, you know, to me, you can't be sure that you can, uh, you can uh, put everyone in that mood. For example, I'm saying you haven't put me in that mood. I don't feel this way about existence. And so, um, you know, your, your uh, attempt to instill this mood in people for whatever reason maybe is going to fail where it's most needed. Like, right, like the person you most want to fear God is the one who's not going to be susceptible to this. I, I, that's I'm reading a lot, granted, into that like one sentence that Cleanthes says. Um, but so in any case, um, um, that's, the, that's the state of the proof. We haven't really gotten to the problem of evil yet. So far, this is supposed to be a proof of the existence of God because we, we desire things we lack. We're dependent beings, and therefore an independent being must exist, to put it in a short form. So what happens next is confusing. Um, it's confusing to the reader and at least apparently confusing to Demia. Although, again, it's not clear what Demia might say if Pamphilus wasn't there. Um, because what happens next is that Philo produces the problem of evil, but he doesn't prove it, produce it as an objection to the proof that Demia, with his help, just um, insisted on. He instead he produ first produces the problem of evil as an argument against Cleanthes, um, so that he's still able to claim that he and Demia are on the same side. And he does that by claiming that um, all this misery and wickedness in the world that they've just been building up um, is a problem for Cleanthes type of God because Cleanthes type of God is supposed to be similar to a human being, at least in some respect. It's supposed to have reason, it's supposed to have a will, and I guess maybe I should have mentioned this last time. It's also supposed to be benevolent in some sense, right? I mean, proving that the world was created by a malicious, powerful being with reason and a will would not really be proving that God exists. <laughs> so, uh, um, and so Philo says, uh, look, you know, all this evil and misery, which on our hypothesis just strengthens the argument for the existence of God because it shows how dependent we are. Um, for you, Cleanthes, it's bad because it, um, because it undermines the um, supposed analogy between the divine attribute of benevolence and the human attribute of benevolence that we know from experience. Um, whereas, Philo says, it doesn't affect Demia and me because um, we both agree that in whatever sense God is, can be called benevolent or just or merciful or anything like that, it means something completely different than it means when you're talking about a human being. Right, so this is on page 63, where Philo says this. And is it possible, Cleanthes, said Philo, that after all these reflections, and infinitely more which might be suggested, you can still persevere in your anthropomorphism. Now, like anthropomorphism, as I mentioned last time, literally means believing that God has a body with a human shape. But they're using it now in a more extended sense. Uh, that, you know, believing that God is similar to a human being 
physically or mentally. Okay, I think, you know, technically what they're talking about might be better called anthropopathism or something else. But in any case, um, is it possible you can still persevere in your anthropomorphism and assert moral attributes of the de deity and assert the moral attributes of the deity, his justice, benevolence, mercy, and rectitude, to be of the same nature with these virtues in human creatures. And then uh, Philo produces the problem of evil in a pretty um, Yeah, in a pretty standard form. In fact, he, you know, um, um, cites ancient sources for this version of the argument. And it's just like, well, if God is benevolent, then um, he must not be all powerful because there is evil. But if God is all powerful, then he must not be benevolent because there's evil. Um, so. Um, um, so, you know, and so the claim is that this works against Cleanthes God, but not against the mystical God that, that he and Demia believe in, because, of course, we say, according to them, that God is merciful and just and benevolent, but we don't mean that there's any similarity between God's qualities and the ones in hum that we in human beings call um, benevolence, justice, mercy, etc. Um, now, I mean, that part is just subtly off from what you traditionally would say about this. Because, I mean, yes, people will say, strictly speaking, when we say God is merciful, we're not talking about God having there's being some analogy between God and human ethical virtue, right? That like God has passions that are regulated by his reason, and et cetera. Um, but, they, but what they would say is, but we call it benevolence because the effects resemble the effects of human benevolence. Right? So as we, we, when we attribute qualities like this to God, we're really talking about the world and then considering God as its cause. So we say God is benevolent. We really mean the world is full of all kinds of good things. God is its cause, you know. So, like, when a human causes all kinds of good things, we call them benevolent. Therefore, we call God benevolent. Whereas Philo is saying the world is all kind of full of all kinds of nasty things, and therefore, when we call its cause benevolent, who knows what we mean? But it's nothing like what we usually mean by benevolence. And so that, of course, is not traditionally what people would see, say. And I think this is the point where Demia starts to realize that something might be going wrong. Um, um, but... Um, um, Well, maybe, except, again, if you think back to what I was saying, maybe Demia really has in mind here that God is the object of hope and fear, then, you know, you can look at it this way. You know, so what this argument has proved this is that since... I'm not a cause that has whatever it wants. I must depend on a cause that has whatever it wants, right? I haven't proved that I depend on a cause that's going to give me whatever I want. Um, in fact, um, you might say if it really gave me everything I wanted as a matter of principle, then I would, I would not be a dependent being. And so I think it would be a contradiction, just like saying a necessary cause should have a necessary effect. Um, but in any case, so what's my relation as a dependent being to this independent being whose existence I've 
um, proved, well, it's not that I know it's going to give me what I want. It's that I hope it will give me what I want. At least uh, if, if I do what, as far as I can tell, I ought to do, then I hope I'll be rewarded. So, um, so therefore, it's okay that we haven't exactly proved to be benevolent. Um, I guess maybe the last part should also be left out, though, because wouldn't that be saying that it's just in a, in a way that Philo thinks we can't prove? Yeah, so leave out that last part. It's just that I hope. I hope. The only hope I have for getting the things I want is from this independent being that is my cause. Therefore, this is a ground for something you might call religion. Um, so anyway, um, that's kind of what's going on behind the scenes. Officially, again, this argument is aimed at Cleanthes, not at Demia. And, um, and Cleanthes, um, as I said, I mean, although Cleanthes doesn't say this explicitly until the beginning of part 11, actually, um, Cleanthes apparently decided a long time ago to give up on the idea that God is infinitely powerful or infinitely wise, perhaps even the, the infinitely benevolent. Um, it's, uh, um, in fact, Cleanthes ends up saying, I think this word infinite that people throw around in theological discussions is really not doing anything good. And we should just say superlatively good, powerful, wise, holy, etc. Um, so, therefore, you know, at this point, the slight philosophical version, this is what I said before, won't work against Cleanthes. But Cleanthes does admit that if you can prove... Um, the world is as bad as you're saying it is, that misery outweighs happiness in human life, etc. Um, then, as he puts it, there is an end at once to all religion. Right? He thinks, because he thinks the only possible proof of the existence of what he calls God is this um, argument from design. And he says, if you can show that the world is really just awful, then... Um, um, then, yeah, the analogy to a benevolent designer, anyway, is no good. Or that, anyway, the analogy to a wise and powerful and benevolent designer is no good. One of those things must fail. Either the designer didn't care about the happiness of the creation, or the designer wasn't powerful enough to bring it about, or the designer... Uh, screwed up. It <laughs> wasn't wise enough to bring it about. Um, so, however, on the other hand, Cleanthes thinks he can defend his argument if he can just show that the world isn't that bad. Right? If I can just show that, you know, so Cleanthes says, on the contrary, there's a lot more pleasure than pain in life. I don't know if that's true or not. I, I mean, um, Bible says various things in response to that, but um, but I think the essence of Philo's response to that doesn't really require arguing about that point. Um, this is where he kind of sums it up. This is on page 69 in part 11. In short, I repeat the question, is the world considered in general and as it appears to us in this life? Right? He's saying that because he's saying we don't have observations of people being rewarded and punished in a future life. We have the observations of is this life here where we are. Is this world considered in general and as it appears to us in this life different from what a man or such a limited being would beforehand expect from a very powerful, wise, and benevolent deity.
Um, because if it's different from that, so as Philo goes into some detail on this, right? Like, suppose you were told, but you'd never seen the world yet. But someone says, you can be sure, you're about to go into the world, and let me tell you for sure, it's the creative creation of a wise, powerful, benevolent being. So you imagine you're in for a really great experience, right? Oh, wow, it's the creation of a wise, powerful, benevolent being. Then you go in and you see, well, happiness kind of maybe outweighs misery in the long run, but there's a lot of... Uh, terrible local exceptions to that where misery is really really bad and um, so but supposing you really trust what they said to you before Philo says okay you can explain that right you say to yourself you know I'm such a finite being I don't really understand what considerations go into making a world and if I'm assuming the author isn't infinitely powerful and wise, then I'm gonna, you know, um, have to assume that it was a difficult problem and this is the best you could do. I mean, that's roughly speaking what Leibniz says about the world. I, you know, that, I mean, very roughly speaking, but that, I mean, you know, the stereotype where Leibniz is, which actually, um, uh, I think it's Philo actually introduces that stereotypical version of Leibniz. Um, uh, but it was Voltaire who really promoted it, right? Which where, where like Leibniz is kind of like blind to the fact that there's anything bad about the world. Leibniz says it's the best of all possible worlds. He thinks it's really great and he doesn't notice that it's, that it's, there's all kinds of problems. But what Leibniz also actually means is that the, in order to be a world at all, there have to be certain problems. And this was the best solution. <laughs> um, right. So anyway, um, so that, but that, that's what you would think if you were assured in advance. But suppose you have no assurance of that and you just see this world. Would you ever conclude from this uh, mixture of... Uh, happiness and misery of uh, virtue and wickedness would you ever conclude that the world was created by a very very powerful wise and benevolent being and Philo says um, there isn't enough evidence for that and the fact that I have no experience of how worlds are made and it could be that this is necessary for some reason is not relevant that's, that's a mere conjecture based on nothing. Um, so what's interesting about this is that, um, again, think back to the first inquiry. Um, Hume, again, is tying this together with his more general views, I think. If, if, if you think about it carefully. Um, the reason that conjectures or hypotheses, um, here, let me actually read what the continuation of what Philo says here, back on page 69. Conjectures especially where infinity is excluded from the divine attributes, may perhaps be sufficient to prove a consistency, right? Again, that is, they can prove that um, uh, it's not impossible that a world like this could be the, created by an infinitely, by, not infinitely, but finitely wise, powerful, and benevolent being. And so if I knew it some other way, uh, this would get rid of the difficulty because I would say, oh, well, you know, I know it's true and it looks like the world contradicts that, but actually, no, it's consistent. S conjectures, so maybe perhaps be sufficient to prove consistency, a, a consistency, but can never be foundation for any inference. And this, I think, is true according to Hume 
I mean, I know is true according to Hume, not just in this specific case, but in general, conjectures can be sufficient to prove a consistency, right? Because anything we can conceive, Hume says, could possibly exist. And again, right, that's because existence isn't another idea that we have to ask whether we could add it with these others or not. Existence, um, or, sorry, the, the, the belief that something exists is just having a stronger, more vivid idea of it. So obviously, if the idea itself is consistent, then it's the idea of something we could believe exists. It would just have to get stronger and more vivid. I mean, that's, maybe there's something that's not 100% obvious there. Are we sure? How do we know which, maybe there are ideas that can't be turned up, so to speak. How do we know that there aren't? But I don't know. Anyway, um, so I'm gonna erase your stand here. Um, so, uh, Whereas on the other hand, inference, but you have to add in here, inference to a matter of fact, right? I mean, inference to consistency, we just said it's fine for that. Inference to a matter of fact, inference to the existence of something or some state of affairs um, can't be based on mere conjecture. It has to be based on what? Well, so Philo might say experience, our experience of the world as in this life. But to, to make that more precise in Hume's terminology, it has to be based on a present impression. So, right, actually what's going on here is just a case of Hume's general point about how belief in matter of fact comes about. There has to be a present impression. You know, something that I'm seeing right now is affecting me and I have an idea of it. And then somehow from that, I can infer to remote matters of fact, like the existence of God. And the reason why that's necessary is because if I start with a mere conjecture, although the conjecture is still related to the thing I'm trying to infer, the conjecture itself doesn't have that force or vividness. And so, right, because I don't believe the conjecture, I'm just supposing it, and so it can't transmit it to the other things that I'm trying to infer from it. For that, I need a present impression, and the present impression then will transmit its force or vividness to the other things, and eventually I can infer the, the remote fact. Um, so, I mean, I'm bringing this up, first of all, just because it's, I think it's interesting to see how this actually ties together. Hume's philosophy actually is systematic. Um, but also, um, because when you think of it in this connection, I think, um, one way to put what's going on here is that Philo is objecting to Cleanthes' inference in the same way that um, Hume objects to the ordinary inference for the continued existence of the objects of our senses. Namely, that um, so the regular working of inference by cause and effect is that I infer exactly as much regularity as I've observed in the past. But in the case of our belief in the continued existence of external objects, and in this case, instead we're trying to explain and observe regularity by means of a greater regularity. Right? So we see a certain amount of convenience, happiness, Adapt, adaptation, things being good for us and for each other in the world. And instead of inferring from that, the, a cause that's just that good and no better, we, inf we try to infer from that a cause that's better. And then we invent a kind of hypothesis, which in both cases, Hume says there's no absurdity in it. It's not inconsistent. 
but it's irrational. Um, it, it's irrational even in the sense that it goes beyond our usual inferences from effect to cause and involves further principles of the imagination. Um, and this, you know, makes it more plausible that Hume actually thinks, might think that there's something in what Cleanthes is saying, or even in what Demia is saying, um, that, um, and you know, that's, that's one of the big questions, I think, about this book. Uh, Hume is supposed to be an atheist. If, if that means he's not um, conventionally believing, he doesn't hold orthodox views, then it's pretty clear from this, despite what, actually, I remembered this wrong last time. This isn't what's in the footnote. This is what Philo himself says at the end of the dialogue, right? At the end of the dialogue, Philo says, and this should make us all good Christians, but you can't take that seriously if you've read the rest of it, I think. So, um, you know, if that's what atheist means, sure. But if atheist means that, that Hume thinks all these proofs that they discuss are all bad, that's not clear at all in the sense that, I mean, yes, he thinks it's irrational, but he may agree when Philo and Cleanthes at the end, or when Cleanthes really at the end says, you know, but it's irresistible. Once I stop thinking about these, you know, abstruse difficulties, I'm going to start believing it again. Um, and before... I'm going to make this point again. Before Darwin, at least, there was a lot to that. I mean, really, I think it was hard to believe that animals and plants, especially, were not designed by someone. Look how well they work, <laughs> right? Um, so... Um, Okay, so that's about that. <laughs> now, um, however, uh, that again, that's officially what's going on. But meanwhile, Demia, listening to this, at some point, Philo becomes so vehement in maintaining that the world is so terrible that it couldn't be caused by any being that's good in any sense. We usually mean that word. <laughs> um, uh, Demia uh, breaks in and says, what's going on, Philo? I thought you were on my side, but now I find you taking the opposite side. And Cleanthes uh, immediately says, yeah, Demia, you just noticed that. Now Philo's been doing this the whole time. You didn't realize? And Philo himself pretty much admits this after Demio leaves, that that's what he was doing, right? He says, um, yeah, you know, Cleanthes, how much I hate bigotry, which bigotry, like originally, I mean, I think now we use it, what was originally a metaphorical sense has taken over as the literal sense, but bigotry originally meant like um, religious uh, intolerance. So, um, so uh, Philo says, you know, you know, I hate bigotry so much that I love to have fun by getting them to uh, pushing them either to say things that are absurd or to say things that are impious. And he says it's easy to do either one. <laughs> right? So um, that's what Philo has been doing this whole time. Um, Again, um, the question is uh, about Demia is whether there's more than meets the eye here. I'll, I'll just, you know, give one more indication of how there could be. I mean, first of all, I'm by no means convinced of this. I mean, it would be just like Hume to represent the, the, uh, bigoted 
religious zealot in the conversation as stupid and, you know, inflexible and whatever. So maybe that's all there is to it. There's just these weird things that don't quite add up or that hint that there could be something else going on. I think that, you know, Demia, um, probably should have said at the point where um, um, where the, something like the problem of evil originally came up. And Demia said, well, but of course, the present evil phenomena are rectified in some future period of existence that has offered a theoretical solution and that that's not going to work for him. He should have said, um, along the lines of what I was think, saying before, conscious as I am of my own imperfection, I must hope that my cause will supply in some other region, etc. And then it wouldn't be a conjecture or a hypothesis. It would be a hope. And this does bring it close to the way Kant's moral proof works, although Kant doesn't mean the same thing by hope. Uh, um, he doesn't mean a passion. Um, but anyway, without getting into the details of Kant, I can't say anything more about it than that. So was that a mistake on Demia's part not to say that? Was it, or I mean, first of all, was it just that Demia's not thinking at all what I've been attributing to him? That's possible. Was it that Demia was thinking that but kind of slips up and, you know, uh, is unable to give the right answers? That's also possible. But it's also possible that Demia didn't feel like he could say that in front of Pamphilus. And so he has no um, option now except to leave. So anyway, we don't know what Demia would say if Pamphilus left, but we do know what Philo and Cleanthes say after Demia leaves. And uh, so in whatever time is left, I'm going to talk about that. Um, there's only one page, is left, one page left in my notes. Maybe I'll actually finish this. All right. So... Um, um, So what happens after Demia leaves is that, first of all, um, Philo claims that he and Cleanthes agree about true religion. And true religion is what they also call philosophical religion, rational religion. It would be natural religion in some sense of natural, not in some other senses of natural. Anyway, um, so, uh, but then they start up a new argument about... Um, new argument, which is worse, false religion or no religion? So Cleanthes says, um, this is on page 82, part 12. Um, religion, however corrupted, is still better than no religion at all. And why? 
The doctrine of a future state is so strong and necessary a security to morals. Right? This is the same thing Locke said a long time ago, except, although we're, it's hard to be sure Locke isn't thinking this too, but basically, like, um, if it weren't true that we're going to be rewarded and punished in a future life, we would have to invent it to enforce morals, <laughs> right? Um, people have to believe that in the long run, it's going to be better for them to do what's in everyone's interest rather than just taking care of themselves. And how can they believe that? Only by thinking that um, the divine law is going to be enforced by an infinitely or at least very powerful and accurate um, executive. Um, whereas Philo says, oh, wait, where is this? I wrote down as an E. Oh, here it is. No period of time can be happier or more prosperous than those in which it, that is religion, is never regarded or heard of. Right, so now Cleanthes and Philo claim to agree about, and what they agree about, although it emerges, I think, as we go on, that maybe they don't quite agree about this either. But what Philo is claiming is that they agree about, that, they, that he really agrees with Cleanthes about the arguments for the existence of God or whatever. So, but now they're arguing about something else. Take superstition, false religion, or no religion, and Philo says, well, this actually is great. He's probably thinking about certain times in antiquity, like before the rise of Christianity, when uh, most people weren't very religious, according to the old religions either, and they were happy, like the Augustan age or something. Um, but, uh, but in any case, he, he claims that the best periods are periods where there's no religion. Now, I mean, by no religion, he means except this true philosophical religion, which very few people ever have, right? Because you need to do all this philosophy to have it. So, um, whereas false religion always throws society into disorder, it causes faction, it causes war, it causes oppression, etc. Whereas Cleanthes says, on the other hand, um, no, uh, we, we need some religion to enforce morality. And if it's, it, since most people aren't going to be capable of the true religion, they better have the false religion. So that's the argument. So, I mean, this actually, notice that this actually is an argument about religion, not about theology. In the way I was kind of hemming and hawing about the difference last time. This is, right, this is not about the existence or properties of God or anything like that. It's about the effects of a certain human institution, religion. Is it good for people or not? And again, granted that this, whatever it is, is, um, first of all, not widespread enough to have much effect. But later on, Philo actually claims that even for the people who believe it, it doesn't have much effect. I mean, they may be virtuous, but that's not why. In fact, Philo says this is the perfect religion for them because they'd be virtuous anyway. <laughs> so a religion that has no moral implications is fine for them. Um, so, uh, so on this agreement, um, it turns out to be a little weird. 
This is why Philo claims to agree with Cleanthes. The disagreement, I mean, there are actually some interesting details to the way they describe, the way they go back and forth about this. I mean, like the way Philo especially tries to explain why Locke's idea that, um, I mean, it's not just Locke's idea, of course, but why the idea that the, that the um, promise of divine rewards or threat of divine punishments would enforce morality doesn't really work. Um, I mean, in addition to all the empirical evidence, which of course we're much we're plenty familiar with now, just as people were in the 18th century, that religion does all kinds of nasty stuff, right? So um, that is kind of interesting, um, but uh, um, but on the whole, it's pretty clear what the lines of division are you know it's just and it is kind of an empirical question does religion make people better or worse or neither um, the same question has been asked about ethical philosophy does it make better people better or worse or neither and actually a year or two ago uh, some people decided to take a survey of professional philosophers and ask them whether they thought that philosophers who specialize in ethics are better or worse or the same. I think the same one. <laughs> I, I don't necessarily think that's a good way of considering the question. Uh, I mean, for one thing, it's not clear that you're thinking about ethics very well if you think you can specialize in it. Um, so you might not even be asking about the right people. Anyway, be that as it may, I wanted to just in the last couple of minutes say a little bit more about this. Boy, is that the right thing to do? I should, I feel, I should give some grand summary of the course, right? And so we see that empiricism is blah, blah, blah. But I don't know. I don't have anything to say like that. So instead, I'm going to just read what Philo says about the agreement here. Um... So Philo, Philo, in fact, says that not only did he and Cleanthes agree about this, but the philosophical theists and so-called atheists all agree about this. So, I mean, so what does he say to the philosophical atheists? He says, um, First of all, he's going to show that he's going to get them to admit that there's some remote analogy between all kinds of different things, processes that happen in the universe. He mentions um, human reason and or human the structure of human thought, the generation of an animal, and the rotting of a turnip. <laughs> So, and he says, I'm going to get the atheist to agree that, yeah, there's something similar about human thought and the rotting of a turnip. And he says, he will readily acknowledge it. Having obtained this concession, I push him still further in his retreat. And I ask him if it be not probable that the principle which first arranged and still maintains order in this universe bears not also some remote, inconceivable analogy to the other operations of nature, and among the rest, to the economy of the human mind and thought. Right? So, I mean, Philo claims to be agreeing with, with Cleanthes, but he's really changed Cleanthes' argument quite a bit. Cleanthes keeps saying, the universe resembles nothing so much as a machine made by human beings for good purposes, well contrived and whatever. Philo says, well, the world doesn't resemble that very much, just like the rotting of a turnip doesn't greatly resemble human thought and reason, but it, you know, resembles it a little bit, just like the rotting of a turnip a little bit resembles human thought and reason. And so, uh, you know, uh, if you say the cause of the world is a little bit like a human being, 
as much like a human being as a rotting turnip is like a human being, or maybe a little bit less. <laughs> yeah, even the atheist will have to agree to that. And I might say, like, even a Darwinist might have to agree that natural selection is a little bit or maybe even a lot like what happens in our brain when we decide to do things. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, yeah, if that's what you mean, I agree with you. But it's not really what Philo wanted. And if that's really Hume's position in the end, um, then it's probably fair to say that yeah, he is better described as an atheist. Okay, that's a little bit of a conclusion, not much, but not a grand conclusion. Um, so uh, thank you very much for bearing with me, especially those who have actually been coming to lecture all this time. I appreciate it. And um, um, don't hesitate to get in touch with me with questions about the paper or whatever, and uh, have a good summer. <laughs>